would be an understatement to say that Foucault is controversial. There are many, many scholars and other people who cannot stand his ideas. They see him as propagating a relativistic worldview that undermines the possibility of concrete knowledge. There was a time, however, in disciplines like history when it was enough to say, as Foucault says, to settle an argument because for a period he was the ultimate arbiter. His popularity seems to have waned somewhat in historiographical circles and I would say that he was beginning to go distinctly out of fashion. However, there can be no doubt that his ideas about madness and a range of other things like punishment have been deeply, deeply influential and it is important that we pay attention to them because they can help us understand not only the nature of madness but also understand some of the ways that historiographical ideas develop. However, I believe in taking a biographical approach when we explore people's ideas because I think that when you can see a life in a time it helps you understand where someone is coming from. So in this section we'll have a part biography and part analysis of Foucault's ideas which were most definitely a reaction against, a revolt even, against the dominant way of thinking about progress and history. Paul Michel Foucault was born in the town of Poitiers in October 1926. His background was resolutely bourgeois, his father Paul a well-respected surgeon. He was educated at the Jesuit College Saint Stanislas. The Jesuit education was pretty hardcore, focusing upon the use of reason. He was educated during World War II, when Poitiers was part of the Vichy, that's that part of France that hadn't been occupied by the Germans, but was controlled by a government headed up by Marshal Pétain, um, who basically collaborated with Germany after the defeat of France in 1940. Conservative times. Pétain replaced liberté, fraternité, égalité, that's liberty, freedom, brotherhood, equality, with travail, famille, patrie, which basically means work, family, country. The war ends things start going back to normal. And that's pretty much where Foucault went. Um, after World War II, he was admitted to the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. Um, this is about as good as it gets in terms of French education. You have to be the brightest of the bright to get in there. Um, but he seems to have experienced some uh, depression. There have even been suggestions that he might have attempted suicide. But whatever, in the process, he becomes interested in psychology and is licensed to practice and works at a Parisian mental hospital. In 1950, he joins the Communist Party of France, like so many others of his generation. He was placed in a cell which included some of the people that were going to become stratospheric in terms of French intellectual life. Louis Althusser, the famous Marxist structuralist, and Roy Le Dury, the micro-historian whose Montaigu is a classic of the genre. Now, Foucault bails before a lot of other people. Most people leave the party um, around about the Hungarian Revolution. But he leaves in 1956. He might have been disillusioned with Stalin. He may not have been that political at that time. He decides that he wants to go into academia. After practicing psychology at Lille, he moves to Uppsala, um, where for a period he acts as the French consul. And then he goes on to Warsaw and Hamburg, all the time writing, all the time thinking, all the time researching. And eventually he writes his dissertation, which is presented for public examination in 1961 and is examined by Georges Conguien, the historian of science, the writer of the normal and the pathological, which laid the groundwork for some of our contemporary understanding of medical history. Conguien and the other examiners could see the depth of talent, indeed the brilliance in Foucault's work. And while they disagreed with elements of his philosophical thesis, 
all agreed that a new star had arrived. And uh, his PhD, his main thesis, Folie et des raisons, Histoire de la folie à l'âge classique, was soon published and then came out in English a few years later as Madness and Civilization, a very abridged version. In 1965, he moves to Tunis when his boyfriend, Daniel Defer, is uh, posted there for military service. And he almost misses the radical upsurge that occurred in 1968. Paris 1968, a watchword for student riots, general revolt. Indeed, it is said that France was in a near revolutionary state. That time, Foucault's still in Tunis, twiddling his thumbs, thinking he does witness a small riot there. Foucault returns to Paris. In 1969, he's elected Professor of Systems of Thoughts at the Collège de France, and he becomes increasingly radicalised. It's the tenor of the times, becomes interested in a whole range of things, from prisoners' right to gay rights. His star continues rising. During the 70s, he goes over to teach in the USA. He even goes out to Death Valley to drop acid to see what kind of experiences that would do to his mind. But eventually, during the late 70s, working in San Francisco, he contracts AIDS and he dies in 1984 of an AIDS-related infection. But his afterlife is extraordinary. He has a huge impact across a number of disciplines history, philosophy, sociology, literary studies. In death, he was even more famous than he was in life. And in life, he was pretty damn famous. What I want you to take away from this is the radical times that Foucault lived in, the people he mingled with, his education, all of which led him to think deeply about the nature of the world, the nature of power, and what made us the people that we are. And this emerges in his writing, a continual dialogue between issues of power, representation, identity and subjectivity. So there we were in the early 1960s, patting ourselves on the back about the progress that psychiatry had made in treating mental illness. And along came a number of people, of which Foucault was one of the most prominent, saying, hang on, you got it all wrong. Madness and Civilization was published later in Britain than it was in France, but it still made a huge impact. It is significant that when it was published in English, the introduction to Madness and Civilization was written by a guy called David Cooper, a radical psychiatrist who had rejected the biomedical reductionism that was at the heart of some of psychiatrists practices. We begin to get a flavour of the book from its introduction, which I've reproduced here in its entirety. As we'll see, Foucault's basic thesis was that there were these institutions, hospitals, that were designed to treat leprosy in the Middle Ages. And then the disease of leprosy started dying out and the hospitals eventually got reused for other purposes. But it's worth listening to the cadence of the language. At the end of the Middle Ages, leprosy disappeared from the Western world. In the margins of the community, at the gates of cities, the stretched wastelands which sickness had ceased to haunt, but had left sterile and long uninhabitable. For centuries, these reaches would belong to the non-human, from the 14th to the 17th century, they would wait, soliciting with strange incantations, a new incarnation of disease, another grimace of terror, renewed rites of purifications. So he's imagining the abandoned leprosoriums, the places where lepers were treated, almost as feeling entities that are waiting for a new sickness to come along and fill them up again. It's an extraordinary piece of metaphorical writing. And I don't even have a clue whether it reads like this in the original French, because this is obviously the translation. I don't know how good a translation this is. Certainly people have imitated this style of writing when they tried to appear Foucauldian. 
But is this the real Foucault or the translator's Foucault? Certainly, when Madness and Civilization was retranslated more recently and published as the longer version, reinstating the bits that had been abridged, it didn't read with this gnomic but dramatic quality. Basically, within Madness and Civilization, Foucault maps out an argument that runs counter to the Whig way of thinking. He starts off in the medieval period with the Ship of Fools. This was a myth about a ship that all these mad people got on board and sailed away on in search of their reason. And Foucault uses this metaphor to describe where madness sat within the Middle Ages imaginary. And what he points out is that the fools, in some sense, were granted a holiness that was going to be lost in later Enlightenment thinking. This view transformed in the early modern period to the notion that folly could contain within it wisdom that might lay bare the nonsense of the world. The image that I put up here is an illustration from King Lear, Lear raging upon the heath, the fool at his side, pointing out the madness of Lear's raging, pointing out to him the way that the world really worked. So the fool, who ostensibly did not possess reason, actually had more reason than the people around him and instructed those in power to exercise their reason better. And this was followed in Foucault's stages by the classical period that might be said to have lasted from the late 17th and through the 18th century, the period that he denotes as the Great Confinement. What happened in the Great Confinement is those hospitals that had laid empty, waiting for a new disease to fill them, began to be filled by all of the people that were inept and inconvenient and couldn't cope with life, to be filled also by the deviant. The notion here of the Great Confinement is that all people that somehow walked outside of society, that were different, that were problematic, got bunged into these institutions. And for Foucault, this was then followed by a new period of differentiation, where, say, the indigent and the poor were hived off from the mad and the criminal, and separate institutions were created to deal with each of those problems. And of course it is at this point that the asylum is created to contain madness. So the argument is basically this, that madness is transformed from meaningful unreason or holy high reason and folly. And in the process, the imaginary ship of fools which seems to be full of the agency of the fools, going off in search of their reason, gets transformed into a dismal hospital that contains them and restricts them. The real lepers are replaced with society's lepers. Underlying all of this was the sense that the moral therapy that in the Whig tradition appeared so humane was not humane at all. Indeed, what we see is the switching of one form of repression for another form of repression. In many cases, a focus upon the body gets switched to a focus upon the mind. And who is to say which is the worst form of oppression? In many regards, if we look at Foucault from this perspective, he's like Whig history on a reverse cycle, where the Whigs saw humanity, Foucault saw a new form of repression. Now, we have to remember that Foucault's ideas on madness were published in the early 1960s. Time moves on, people move on. People's ideas don't stay the same. And it was certainly the case that Foucault's ideas did not stay the same. Philosophically, he moved from a position that's known as archaeology to genealogy. Archaeology was basically a very similar exercise that had been carried out by Thomas Kuhn when he looked at the whole notion of paradigms. Foucault sketched out the idea of epistemes. Epistemes were basically the structure of thought within society or culture. They provided the boundaries or perhaps the scaffolding would be a better way of describing it, of all the things that could be thought or said. They were the structure 
of our existence, of our thinking. And in this regard, Foucault's work in Madness and Civilization was trying to sketch out those structures to understand how the mad became differentiated from the sane. But he seemed to become increasingly more interested in the work of Nietzsche, interested in how it was that there was an ingrained will to power within each of us, and how it was that knowledge produced power and power produced knowledge. So increasingly, Foucault started looking at genealogy, specifically at the way our sense of ourselves, our subjectivity, was the product of power. And he focused on two areas, one of which was sex, which he dealt with very much towards the end of his life. The other was the domain of punishment, which he looked at in his book Discipline and Punish. There, he explored the way that a new penal system invoked a new sense of subjectivity or identity in the individual. He invoked a system whereby punishment had shifted from punishment of the body to punishment of the mind. And he explored how this created a changed sense of self in every single one of us. The notion of us internalising the sense of being watched, internalising the possibility of punishment, having each and every one of our minds targeted. And in this sense, we can see the origins of this idea in his non-genealogical madness and civilization, And it's very easy to read backwards from genealogy, from discipline and punish, on his more structural work that focused upon epistemes. And certainly that was something that Foucault himself had started to undertake during the latter parts of his life. When historians adopt Foucault, they do so on the basis of moulding the two different eras of Foucault together and seeing his history of madness as talking about a history of ourselves as ourselves and how we've been produced by power. But the real take-home message here is that issue that I've already mentioned, that Foucault reversed time's arrow, that he suggested that there had been no progress made in terms of the leap from the chained William Norris to the lunatics making merry at their balls at the Hanwell Asylum. All he saw was the switch from one form of repression to another. No progress. And in some ways, that switch from the body to the mind was even more repressive. It's no wonder that a lot of people had it in for him. Not just psychiatrists, not just medical people, but historians as well.